you don't. Good. So, uh, very, very good morning uh, to you. It's so nice to see so many people in the room. I'm just excited just to see that. Uh, we have a, a pretty good number online too. So we coming back to our regular norm, you know, the, uh, numbers. And this is a subject that is so, so thrilling. I have to say every time I go back into looking at Rubens, uh, and it's not because he, he's a compatriot. Could somebody turn off the light? That would be really nice. Thank you, Jerry. I'm going to uh, mute my group here to make sure that everybody is silent there. Um, he's just an incredible individual beside uh, being a great artist, but as a man, he was always exceptional. And it's very rare to, to meet somebody so uh, proficient in so many things. Uh, and that was renowned all over Europe. So there are very few artists, maybe Titian would be a comparison, but he never had the charisma that uh, Rubens had. So let's first talk about him. And he's got an interesting use. Let me, sorry, I'm always delayed there. There we are. Uh, in 1568, if you remember the history that I mentioned uh, last time, uh, these were troubled times uh, in the Netherlands, because we still talk about the whole Netherlands at that time. Um, there was a lot of turmoil because Philip II, who had succeeded Charles V, uh, wasn't as attached to the Low Countries as his father was, because his father <coughs> was born in the Low Countries and had particular love for it. Philip was born in Spain and didn't know much about uh, the Low Countries, just so it is a great let's say, a well of treasure <clears throat> and a place that he could tax even heavier because it was such a rich place. I mean, it was one of the richest um, region in the whole of Europe at that time. So he, after uh, Charles V stepped down in, in uh, 1556, uh, the uh, uh, Philip, II, Philip II took over. Tony, there is some seats here at the front if you want. Oh, great. And there are some flyers at the back if you, if you need any. My gear is on slow. Yeah, Sorry. next to Mardell. <laughs> okay. So um, we know that at that time, a lot of the uh, towns in the Netherlands uh, revolted because uh, Philip II not only wanted to tax them heavily, but also wanted to take from them a lot of their privileges. And so at that time, you know, the, the, the cities would get special privileges and were able to be, to have a kind of independence. So anyway, to cut a long story short, uh, this started a lot of trouble and it will end up with the North seceding from the South. So ending up the way we now know the Netherlands at the, in the North and Belgium in the South. So being from Antwerp, uh, Ruben's father um, was, again, on another point I have to, to insist on is that Antwerp at that time was one of the most uh, tolerant cities in the whole of Europe. There were lots of religion. You had a majority of Catholics, but you had some Protestants, you had some Jews, you had Anabaptists, you had a whole series of religion in Antwerp. Philip wanted to turn that around and it came a little later. But so when uh, Jan Rubens uh, and his wife were in Antwerp, they were Calvinist. And in 1568, they decide to move to Cologne, um, Germany, uh, for business. He was a pretty known lawyer. 
uh, Rubens was coming from a, a pretty good family. He became the legal advisor to Anne of Saxony, who happened to be the wife of William the Silent. And to refresh your memory too, William the Silent is the one who headed the revolt movement from the North. And so himself was, uh, had been converted to Calvinism. So we now have that separation. The South remains mostly Catholics by force or by conviction. And the North is uh, mostly Calvinist, but tolerant to other religions. So in Cologne, uh, Jan Rubens becomes the legal advisor to Anne uh, of Saxony, who was left in the chateau uh, in Cologne. Actually, it's in Siegen, not too far from uh, Cologne. But she happened to be kind of nymphomaniac and went after Rubens' father until he felt really obliged to agree. <laughs> Unfortunately for them, she became pregnant and her husband had been gone for over nine months. So yeah, that's a big problem. So uh, she was actually uh, penalized and had to stay in residence. But for uh, Jan Rubens, it was much worse. So in 1570, he was imprisoned and condemned to death for adultery with Anne of Saxony. Uh, Thanks to his wife, uh, Maria, uh, she wrote letters after letters to William the Silent to ask for grace, for him for mercy. And uh, the death sentence was commutated uh, to house arrest until he finally was pardoned in 1578 after Anne of Saxony died. So there was no more history with her, she was gone. And so uh, they kind of, he, he was able to start working again, but for uh, quite a while when he was in house arrest, he couldn't see anybody. So his wife had to really be very crafty to try to make some money uh, and survive. They already at that time uh, had uh, three children or four children actually uh, in Cologne. So two girls and two boys. And yes. What happened to their child? the child of Anne of Saxony. She, I think she died before she had the, the, the child. So there was never any uh, follow up on that. But it was kind of interesting because William the Silent was, I mean, he's the ancestor of the Nassau family to give you, he was a very important figure. So um, in 1577, Rubens, the Peter, Peter Paul Rubens was born in Siegen um, was the sixth of seven children. Yes, there was one uh, that was uh, born later on. In 1587, after Jan died, the family relocated to Antwerp and they had in the meantime reconverted to Catholicism. Whereas Cologne was tolerant for Calvinists, they were still very much uh, Catholic there and the, uh, the Rubens family had been pressured to come back to Catholicism. So they reconverted to Catholicism. And when um, Rubens arrived, uh, Peter Paul arrived in uh, Antwerp, he was put in a very good school, a Latin school. And so uh, went on learning the classics that he had started knowing with his father. Because of the lack of revenues of his mother, uh, once he was out of school, he was uh, put in kind of an apprenticeship as a page with uh, Marguerite de Ligne. Uh, Mar the Ligne family is still a very important family in, in uh, Belgium. Uh, she, they are princes. Uh, and so he was for one year a page with Marguerite de Ligne, which taught him probably the higher level of um, society rules, if you want. And that's gonna serve him extremely well uh, once he becomes adult. But despite the fact that being a painter was not considered as something very um, high, high level for a family of that rank, uh, he really was, he wanted to become a painter. And his elder brother, Jan Baptist, was also a painter, but was never uh, really known. 
So he forced the hand of his mother and in 1591 became an apprentice to Verhacht, uh, who was a landscape painter, not very famous and probably cheaper to, to be set as an apprentice. As you know, you had to pay the painter to become an apprentice. Uh, so he spent one year with him and he probably learned all the the technicalities of how to make pigments and prepare canvases and so on, or boards. And then he spent another uh, few months with Adam van Noort, another kind of second rank painter. Finally, in 1592, he became apprentice to Otto van Veen, who was a much bigger name in Antwerp at that time. And by 1598, joined the St. Luke uh, Guild as a master. Uh, he went on working with uh, Van Veen, who was, uh, uh, had started as a mannerist painter, we'll see some of his work uh, later, uh, but was especially an intellectual. He's a, a person who had studied a lot the classic literature, had uh, spent an, quite a, an amount of time in Italy, and uh, for Rubens, who was quite an intellectual, it was a very good contact until Van Veen decided to really push him, said, you have to go to Italy. You have to see Rome and the, the other cities. You see the, the grand classics, you have to see the uh, antiquities and so on. And so in 1600, he departs to Italy and we'll see a little more of that and was, uh, employed at the court of Mantua by the Gonzaga family. Uh, he was um, probably, he already had met the archdukes, uh, Albert and Isabella in Antwerp, uh, who were uh, closely related to the Gonzagas and probably got some um, letter of references to them. But he also met some people in Venice who uh, immediately picked up on, on his personality and said, you have to go to Mantua, small town, but great culture. And so he went there and then in 1608 came back to Antwerp. So here are uh, his teacher. This is uh, Tobias Verhacht on the top. Uh, and you see here mostly a landscape artist with small figures not very talented, but Antwerp had such an incredible amount of painters that you had painters that were probably a little cheaper, but were making pretty good living. Uh, the second one, Adam van Noort, uh, is already better. He's a figure painter, and um, he became actually the father-in-law of another painter we'll talk about, uh, Jacob Jordaens, uh, was known for making small paintings, but anyway, uh, Rubens learned until he went to Otto van Veen. Otto van Veen was uh, originally from Leiden in the north, northern provinces, but he was a Catholic and so had moved back, moved to Antwerp. He had visited Italy where he was a pupil of uh, Federico Zucaro, who is a big name in Italy. And then in 1592 settled in Antwerp, and this is more or less when Rubens met him. Here you see one of his early works. He had been influenced by Mannerist painters in Italy, and then changed coming back to Antwerp uh, slowly to the more, uh, the Maniera Grande, as uh, we'll see uh, the same thing that uh, Rubens will go on with. He was often modeling his work after uh, Correggio and Parmigianino. As I mentioned, he, he was an intellectual, what they call pictor doctus, so a doctor in painting, if you want. Uh, he was uh, an inventor of scholarly allegories with neo-stoic uh, neo undertones. And he was also quite busy making em emblems for prints. And emblems were kind of little uh, illustration of um, proverbs and often very wise proverbs. And then he would make an illustration to show, uh, to make it more uh, telling. Uh, he was, uh, Rubens was at that time, as I mentioned, made for uh, a humanist world. He was very broad-minded. 
and uh, benefited from meeting the wealthy clientele of Van Veen. Uh, Pictor, doc, Pictor Doctus is really the idea of elevating the status of the painter, uh, the idea that he's not just a craftsman as it was believed before, uh, but uh, more of an intellectual who was using his knowledge to make extraordinary composition. And the Grande Maniera is the idea of uh, using the same time of composition and grand style as what he had seen with Titian and others in Italy. So let's look because he, uh, the young man uh, made quite a trip once he went to, to Italy. Uh, he started uh, going down, he went with a, a friend of his, um, Deodat del Monte, this is the Italianized word, this is normally Deodat van der Monte in Flemish, but uh, at that time it was very fashionable to Latinize your name. And so uh, Deodat del Monte became his name and stayed with Rubens the whole time he was in Italy and remained a very close friend. So they went down as it was typical at the time through Venice. Spent a little time in Venice, had the time to see the Titian, Tintoretto, Veronese, and all the great artists of the 16th century there. Uh, met a lot of family. Rubens was a pretty good looking man. So uh, women were very uh, attached to him and, and were following him everywhere. Uh, but so he, he had very good manners and it pleased the, you know, the aristocracy. He was a man that could uh, really deal with them. From Venice, uh, he went on to uh, Mantua. As I say, he had received letter of references and met the Gonzaga family who immediately made him court painter. And so he became a court painter, but much more than that. Because of his uh, behavior, his uh, attitude, they, they really uh, appreciated him also as that kind of ambassador, which is something is going to follow him. So very quickly, as soon as he's there, he's uh, going with the uh, Gonzaga uh, family to Florence uh, to attend the marriage by proxy of Mary de' Medici and uh, Henry IV. And uh, little did he know that later on, Mary was going to become uh, quite a protector of his. So really interesting, he probably never met Mary there, but he saw, he attended that quite uh, big ceremony. Came back to Mantua and there the king decides that he wants to send him to Spain together with a whole shipment of gifts for the king of Spain. Uh, Mantua, as I mentioned, was a small piece of, uh, was a small state because it's part of all these city states that you have in Italy, uh, but um, wanted to keep in very good contact with uh, Spain that at that time uh, had a great influence in Northern Italy. So he sends uh, Rubens together with uh, at least four or six horses uh, the Gonzaga were known to have a fantastic stable and he knew, they knew that Philip uh, at that time uh, was very uh, keen, Philip III by that time, uh, was very keen on, on beautiful horses. Uh, so not only four or six horses, but also a carriage. Um, he had all kinds of gifts, beautiful vases and, and pots and large paintings that were often copies of very known paintings that existed in Venice or, or around were not by the hand of Rubens, but so he was in charge. These were really packed very well, but unfortunately, as you can imagine, from Mantua, he had to go to probably Genoa. And from Genoa, took a ship all the way to Spain. That was a much safer way to, to travel than by, by the road and particularly with the horses and so on. So it took them about three weeks to make it to, um, I think it was, they arrived by Valencia or something like that. 
the horses and the carriage did well. The gifts we did well, but the paintings were almost rotten because it was so they had had rain for at least two weeks during the trip. And uh, the, the canvases were in terrible condition. So Rubens had to actually replace some of the paintings hastily painted by him to be offered to the king and did apparently a superb job. So they really appreciated what it is. Now, when he arrived in Spain, he thought that he was going to find the king at the Escorial, but he wasn't. He was in, Val in Valladolid. And so uh, they tried to follow him. And every time they arrived, the, the king had already moved to the next town. So finally, they met him and uh, gave him all the gifts. He was very pleased. And then Rubens, uh, but in the meantime, Rubens was able to see at the Escoria the incredible collection of art that had been gathered by Philip II and by uh, Philip III, uh, went through Madrid, saw all the beautiful paintings, and then went back by horse, by horseback uh, through France and uh, back to, to Italy. He had to go for his money because he spent an enormous amount of money going this and he was had to go to some of the banks to make sure he would have his money. Uh, on the way back to Mantua, he stopped in Genoa and in Genoa met the great the, the very wealthy families that were associated with uh, trade and so on and was able, as we'll see, to make some extraordinary portraits, which are going to be quite influential on Van Dyck when he spent some time later on in, um, in um, Genoa. And then he went back to Mantua and twice at least went uh, down to Rome, where you can imagine uh, he spent a lot of time in the Sistine Chapel and in the Vatican collection, looking at the collection of uh, antique statues that belong to the Vatican, uh, and of which he made a tremendous amount of uh, drawings that he will refer to regularly in his paintings. So for him, he had his, his uh, sketchbook all the time with him and he would copy this and copy that. And, and then as it was the, the habit at that time would take that little cameo here and transpose it in one of his paintings because they were ideas of position and so on. So really interesting, there was nothing, you can't consider that cheating. At that time, it was to the contrary. Uh, a reference to the intelligence of the painter. Uh, it was a subject of discussion. People would look at the painting by him and say, oh, look at that, he's used the Laocon there, or he's used the Hercules, Farnese uh, Hercules there. Uh, this was a show of knowledge of the classics. So here is just for you to uh, locate him in, um, in time. I put the, the different painters that were very, uh, this one that is missing there is uh, Correggio, uh, the, the painters that had quite an influence on him. Uh, Michelangelo, Titian, Tintoretto, Caravaggio. Caravaggio is a contemporary of Rubens. They probably never met, but Rubens was able in uh, Rome to see the works of Caravaggio and could immediately appreciate his genius. And he's gonna be instrumental for uh, his patron, uh, Gonzaga, to uh, buy many of his works that were rejected by others. So uh, we have Rubens and I put in yellow the time he spent in Italy. So you can see uh, this is the time he spent in Italy. Uh, his probably favorite assistant collaborator is Van Dyck. And then your dance is another of the contemporary who are going to be uh, really good, but unfortunately for them overshadowed by Rubens who became so incredibly famous uh, and this is why Van Dyck went to, to England. Uh, Jan Brugel became a very good friend and very close friend of uh, Rubens. Uh, they were godfathers of their kids, uh, one another, and, and would work together. We'll see that later in collaboration quite often. I put here so you can situate Franz Hals and Rembrandt 
they didn't know one another, but you just to, to, for you to locate. And then at the bottom, you can see that uh, Philip II dies in 1598, succeeded by his son, Philip III. So Rubens is mostly gonna deal with Philip III and Philip IV of Spain. So let's look at these great masters that were so influential on Rubens. Uh, Titian, of course. Uh, Titian mostly, and mostly for his later work, his quick brushwork, you know, he had evolved from uh, regular brushwork to later in life to a, a very spontaneous brushwork and the extraordinary choice of colors. And so uh, Titian will be uh, influential uh, particularly for the color and the brushwork, which is going to be reproduced regularly by uh, Rubens. Tintoretto, the light, the, the extraordinary light of Tintoretto, and the beginning of that tenebrism, of that contrast of dark and light, not as much as Caravaggio, but uh, particularly for that. So that's in Venice. In Mantua, of course, he sees the um, new architecture, the, the new old architecture of Alberti in Mantua. This is the famous uh, Saint Andrea church in Mantua uh, that was really one of the early, typically Renaissance works with that uh, classicizing architecture. But also the works of Mantegna, including the uh, Camera Picta. Uh, or the um, wedding room of uh, by Mantegna that is so extraordinary in representing something very lively, which is the Gonzaga family. This was supposed to be the, the bride's room. So you can imagine the couple being in there and being watched upon <laughs> by the whole family. So quite interesting. And then the beautiful Oculus with cherubs and servants looking over. Also in Mantua, you have in the Palazzo uh, Te, Del Te is uh, not Del Te, De, Palazzo De Te, sorry, uh, is the incredible uh, Sala dei Giganti, uh, showing these, that room with all these giants and the, it's these clouds where they are uh, coming down to, to beat the, the giants down to the ground. It's just an amazing fresco uh, by Giulio Romano, who was the favorite pupil of Raphael and succeeded him, but had to flee uh, Rome at the time of the sack of Rome. So he took refuge in Mantua. But also he take the soft modeling of Correggio that was also uh, one of the favorite uh, painters at, in Mantua. One of my favorite paintings too. Uh, I love that one, Jupiter and Io. Uh, it's, it's just superb because you barely see the face of Jupiter, they're kissing Io uh, coming out of the cloud. And then you have that kind of a paw that is just embracing her. It's, it's extraordinary. Uh, but also in the court of Mantua, we didn't only have painters, but it was really a humanist court. Uh, the uh, Gonzaga had gathered around them mm -hmm. the most important poets. Uh, Torcato Tasso spent quite a time over there. The composer Claudio Monteverdi uh, spent uh, quite a time at the court too. And the astronomer Galileo Galilei found a very good terrain uh, there. So it must have been an extraordinary atmosphere to be surrounded by all these uh, interesting people. Rubens had a brother, a slightly older brother that he adored. It was Philip Rubens. And uh, as both of them were very intellectual, Philip had pushed that much further, had studied in the University of Leuven uh, and uh, had studied under Justus Lipsius was a neo-Stoic scholar and was supposed to replace literally uh, Justus Lipsius uh, later on. And so Philip came to Mantua with some of his friends. And this is a painting that Rubens did at that time in 1602. So two years after his arrival there, 
<coughs> of his, um, you have uh, Rubens here and you have behind, you have Philip, his brother. Behind them, but not present actually is Justus Lipsius, the great scholar, neo-stoic stoic, uh, scholar who had translated all the works of Seneca and was really trying to adapt the philosophy of, of Stoicism of Seneca to the present world. Uh, and then you have on the left, I'm going to go on with the names. Uh, it's either Frank Porpoise, we're not sure because there was no indication there. Uh, it could be either Frank Porpoise who was a Flemish painter that was used uh, in the Northern of Italy as a portrait painter, very famous in Northern Italy. Most of the portrait painters in the Northern of Italy came from Flanders. They were renowned to be um, great portraitists. And so they were used in Italy. Uh, so it's either him or Galileo. They must have looked pretty similar. We have Philip Rubens in the back, Peter Paul in the looking at us, and then Justus Lipsius, the scholar. While he was in Spain, because he had shown so much talent in quickly painting these large canvases for the king, uh, he was asked by the Duke of Lerma, who was the very important um, close counselor, advisor, minister to uh, the king, to paint, a, paint uh, a portrait of his. And what is interesting is that he shows him on a horse, which was normally only authorized for a ruler. You had to be a king or a duke to be able to be shown on a, on a horse. It was really uh, a privilege for the, the very top people. But Duc de Lerma was very important. And so he shows him on the horse and he shows him with all these clouds and, and vegetation there that makes it kind of a um, spiral all around him, and, but really bring him out. Uh, also trying to uh, keep the good proportion between the beautiful white horse and the Duke himself. This is very much inspired of a work by Titian showing uh, the emperor uh, Charles V on the horse. These were among the first paintings showing uh, kings and emperors on horses. And the palms that you see on top are just an allusion to his multiple victories. When he was in Genoa, he, as I mentioned, had access to the, the big families and the Doria family, that's all to do with ships and so on. He made that extraordinary portrait, which unfortunately in the 19th century was cut down at the bottom. Uh, it was normally an uh, entire portrait, as you can see in the study that Rubens had made on the left. So it used to be a full portrait of uh, the lady, but for whatever reason, uh, it was cut down. But we can see already how six years after arriving in Italy, his mastering uh, portraiture and the, the incredible handling of texture. It's, it's I think, a superb uh, painting with that enormous ruff around the neck. It must be incredibly uncomfortable but was the fashion was the fashion for quite a long time and the, the head it's in the sense surrounded by that red uh, drapery at the back that makes the the, the head of the young woman coming out it, it's an extraordinary portrait it's going to be extremely uh, influential on the tradition by van Dyck and later on in england reynolds and uh, gainsborough in Rome, of course, it's plethora. He has so much to look at. You can imagine the young men just running around and, and enjoying and absorbing everything and sketching madly. So um, he, of course, sees at the Vatican the sculpture of the Laocon, which had been discovered in, if I remember, what, 1504, uh, while Michelangelo was in Rome at that time. 
And um, we, we have to remember that in early Christianity, a lot of the sculptures had been either demolished or had to be hidden, not to be demolished by the Christians. And so they, um, this was discovered in the field, in the kind of a, a cave under the, the, the fields and was considered, they knew of the Laocon because it was part of the <coughs> literature by Pliny the Elder. So this is the way that Rubens is gonna go home with all this treasure. This is the drawing he made of the sculpture as he did with all the Apollo Belvedere, every sculpture that he liked, the Venus uh, Pudica and so on, he's all going to eternalize them for himself. And it's going to become a wealth of information for him. With the Belvedere torso, you can see his uh, sanguine there on the, the left. And it's the time where he's going to write uh, little treatise on the, the imitation des statuorum, uh, which is on about the copy of sculpture. And his point is that you can copy sculpture, but when you turn it into a drawing, it has to look like flesh. It shouldn't have the coldness of, of marble. You should really have a feeling that it becomes flesh. And so that judicious use judicious use uh, be made of them that in no way permits the stone to show. And that was his idea. And when he uses these uh, beautiful sculptures as model, he's gonna turn really, he's gonna turn them into flesh. And that's one of the few treatises that he ever wrote. Of course, he's gonna see the apartments of the Vatic of the Pope with uh, the multiple frescoes by Raphael. Uh, in Raphael, of course, the most important thing is the disegno, is the composition. Uh, so he's really looking at the way Raphael, uh, the, that his figures interact with one another. And guess what? A lot of time in the Sistine Chapel, and as they say, his neck must have been hurting, sketching every single of the, the Inudo, Inudi or the uh, different cameos of uh, the creation and so on. He also looks at Anibale Karachi, who is a contemporary. And so he is going to look at a few of his paintings, but also at the, the wonderful fresco ceiling uh, that the Karachi produced. And there it's also that the, the grande maniera is the idea of that classical learned way of composing figures that they really mean something. And then finally, the other contemporary is Caravaggio. And there is discussion. We don't know that he never met Caravaggio, but he was there when Caravaggio was there. So it's difficult to, to know, but we have no proof that he would have, but he was incredibly influenced by him. Uh, this is one of the examples. This is the entombment of Christ. Um, at that time, Caravaggio was at the top of his fame. He was so more realistic than any of the other painters of the time. And uh, so for Rubens, he's gonna be inspired by the, the, the theatrical aspect of Caravaggio's art, but he's not gonna copy the, um, the type of uh, model that he's going to use. Rubens will always have more decorum than uh, Caravaggio. And this is, for example, the work that he copied later on. This was, again, there's no cheating. They never pretend that it was a creation of his, but he is going to copy many of the paintings that he really appreciated. Imagine, you see, this was done in 1614. So that's a, a painting, a copy made uh, almost 10 years after he saw the painting. Yes. Could you explain what you just said? I mean, Ruben, uh, 
Yeah, yeah uh, in he's going to you know he's influenced by all these painters that we just talked about, uh, but he's taking some of their qualities. And with Caravaggio, Caravaggio was known to use very people from the street as models. Uh, you know the 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 Virgin uh, with the Rosary or the Virgin and the Pilgrims that you see. She's a regular woman. She's not on one of these classical beautiful models that the other would use. And Rubens will have a tendency to be more uh, have more decorum than that in his composition. But he's going to borrow that theatrical effect that Caravaggio uh, procures. So he will be asked during his stay in, um, in Rome for multiple altarpieces. And it's really interesting because there he's still a young master, but he is going to uh, make some uh, paintings for about four or five different churches, uh, including this one uh, that was uh, commissioned by the oratorians for Santa Maria in Valicella, also known as the Chiesa Nuova. Uh, what they wanted is to be able to display a miraculous painting uh, that they had that had been transferred from the old church to the new one uh, and integrate it in a large painting so that it would be more appealing. So very quickly, Rubens was chosen to do that because his patron uh, knew of him. It was not the choice of the oratorian. And the oratorian, by the way, are Philippe, uh, uh, were founded by Philippe of Neri. And so just really known for uh, the music and the, the chants as well as the, the great sermons. And so they wanted a painting displaying uh, St. Gregory the Great. And Rubens came out with this uh, and it was rejected. They didn't like it. It was too, um, too formal probably. And the, another excuse was that apparently because of the canvas and the varnish, uh, there was a bad, light ex exposition and it reflected on it and you couldn't see exactly well. So he said, okay, he took it out and repainted something on slate. And slate is a surface that doesn't reflect as much and he made something very different. But in the meantime, he took that painting back with him to Antwerp and we'll see, uh, he will put this on the tomb of his mother. Unfortunately, it's gonna be stolen by the French during, uh, during the French Revolution and ends up in the Beaux-Arts in Grenoble, was never restituted to Belgium. Most of the paintings that were in smaller museum in France after the revolution never gave back their works. The one that were in the Louvre, yes, but not the others. So, he repainted the, the piece, and this is, by the way, the interior of uh, uh, Santa Maria della Valicella. And this is the altarpiece. So a very different painting, as you can see, much clearer, much it, more, more Italian in, in style, if you want, where you have uh, some uh, apostles there that are looking at the image of the Virgin. But what you have to see, the, the image that you see there is painted by Rubens, but it's kind of inserted. There is a whole mechanism. You can, with a rope, pull that image down and then appears the old fresco painting that is the miraculous image. And that would be shown only at very, at certain time uh, in the year. Otherwise it would be protected by the painting by Rubens. So very different type of uh, painting, as I say, uh, where you see that. And then there were two separate paintings on the side showing St. Gregory and some other saints that were dear to the, the heart of the oratorians. So um, is in 
just finished with this when he uh, gets a, a mail, literally, <laughs> uh, from Antwerp that his mother is very sick. And so he abandons everything. He hops on, on the horse and he goes back to Antwerp, unfortunately, to arrive nine days after his mother has died. Um, but it's really interesting. He wasn't sure that he was going to stay in Antwerp. He loved Italy so much so that he will always sign Pietro Paolo Rubens, never Peter Paul Rubens. He, he loved Italian. He was actually, his way of, of exchanging letters with his best friends was always in Italian. So he really had a love for the language and the culture. But when he arrives in Antwerp, it's almost like the, the word had come before him that he had become a great painter. And before he can even think of going back to Italy, he's submerged by, by commissions. And it's um, all to pieces. Don't forget Antwerp had been quite damaged during the iconoclast fury. Uh, and so the, a lot of churches had been rebuilt or restored and they needed new art. And so Rubens comes exactly at the right time. Also, uh, see in 1600, there were two uh, new governors of the low countries. We're talking only the lower uh, provinces. Uh, Albert and Isabella, we'll talk about them in a second, uh, but were patron of the arts. And very quickly, they hear about Rubens and they make him court painter. This is a great privilege. Particularly, they were in Brussels, he is in Antwerp. He manages to say, I want to stay in Antwerp. And they agree. And they also give him the right to uh, work for other patrons. But being court painter, he doesn't have to register his assistants and pupils and so on with the guild. This is a particular privilege for court painters. So he's going to have a much larger number of uh, pupils than any other painter of the same period because he's court painter. Otherwise, he had to pay taxes on each of them. So in 1609, he becomes court painter to the Archdukes Albert and Isabella. In the same year, uh, during the wedding of his brother Philip, he meets a young woman, uh, Isabella Brandt who is the daughter of one of the four secretaries of Antwerp. And when we talk the secretaries, they in fact, the four most important figure under the mayor. And so Jan Brandt um, had multiple children and Ma uh, Isabella was the youngest one. And he marries her and she, she will give him three children. Same year, he's elected to the very select brotherhood of the Romanist because he had been to Rome and he was a classic uh, learner. Uh, and so already in 1610, uh, he was, when he got married, he lived in the house of Jan Brandt with his wife. But the year after he buys a house on the Wapper, which was, is not a, a very nice square, but at that time was along a canal. And uh, he buys a house, buys the, the land next to it, uh, and build himself a, a very Baroque, Italian Baroque house next to, um, to the Gothic house that he buys. Unfortunately, a year later, he loses his uh, brother, Philip, uh, very early uh, death, and that for him, it's a real catastrophe. In 1623, he will lose his elder daughter, uh, Clara. She's the elder of the three. Uh, the other two are boys, Nicholas and, and uh, Albert. And then in 26, he's going to lose his wife of the plague. Yeah, so the, life wasn't very much at that time. Before we go on with him, I just wanted to talk about Albert and Isabella. These are first cousins. Albert being uh, coming from the, the, the Austrian branch of the Habsburg, uh, of a brother of, um, 
of Charles. So Ferdinand, you had Charles V, I should have brought the, the uh, genealogy, but you have Ferdinand and Charles V. So uh, Isabella is a daughter of, uh, a granddaughter of uh, Charles V and Albert is a grandson of Ferdinand. And so they marry and they are put in charge as governor of the Spanish Netherlands with the idea that if they have a child or an heir, he's going to succeed um, at that position. They never had any children, um, but they were really good for the Spanish Netherlands for a short period of time. Uh, he, they, as, almost as soon as they arrived, they managed in 1609 to decree a tr uh, peace that's going to last for 12 years. It's really going to allow uh, Antwerp to recover from the constant war they had known for years. So as I said, also extremely uh, generous patron of the arts. As you can see them again, we see them with this enormous ruff. So I thought I was going to bring you a little explanation on the ruff. <laughs> Uh, the ruff that was born by men, women, and children has evolved from a small fabric ruffle um, that had a drawstring uh, and that would just gather the thing. And then it ended up with the help of the goffering iron to become stiff and it was, they put a starch on it so that it would stay and it would really stand around the neck. It is quite incredible. Uh, as we've seen with uh, Isabella, she also had lace at the, the edges of the ruff. So um, sometimes they were entirely made of, of lace, as you can imagine. Did this, have a purpose? Pardon? Did it have a purpose? It's just fashion. <laughs> it, it started with just a ruffle. You can imagine they had uh, chemise, they had shirts that they would put under all the clothes. And at, it started with just the chemise, the, the, instead of having a collar, just with the, the, the little point there, they had, it was a big one that they would just gather around the neck and it would give you that small ruffle around, uh, more similar to what you see with the portrait of Elizabeth there. But then is, they say, oh, this is cute. It really makes a frame for my face. And it grew and grew and became this enormous wheel, literally, that they were uh, wearing uh, around. So it lasted for a certain time, went on even uh, in, until the early 17th century when you see in Holland and then it disappeared. Uh, it became softer and became just a color. But that was, it always fascinated me how they, they could go around and you see the Duc de Guise over there in 1588. Excuse me, I have something to say. This reminds me of uh, RBD's colors that she used to use. I mean, they weren't like stiff, but kind of like the same idea, right? <clears throat> I didn't get exactly what you said. Could you repeat? Ah, uh, certainly. Yeah, no, I was saying that this reminds me of the colors RBD used to use, the judge. Um, they were not as stiff, but... Okay, RBD, yes. But it, it, it held on and then it, it was uh, with uh, the Calvinism started to abolish that because they thought it was too reminiscent of the Spaniards. So we can see, for example, the idea of collection, as we mentioned with uh, Albert and Isabella, was very strong. And this extraordinary painting that is at the Rubenshuis in uh, Antwerp uh, by uh, Willem van Nacht shows the archdukes, you see them both with their ruff, uh, in that extraordinary collect, you know, collection room of uh, van der Geest. Uh, and next to, to him, to them, is uh, Rubens, he is Cornelis van der Geest, the owner of the gallery. They're showing to the uh, Archdukes a painting by Memling. And so we're going back to the 
very beginning of the 16th century, Memling was considered one of the best after Van Eyck. And uh, they really wanted that painting, but the Van der Geest never sold it to them, but they wanted to admire it. And so you have uh, Rubens here. Uh, at the back there, you have Van Dyck. And so this is not the reality of something that happened because these people were not together. But it's really that kind of uh, amazing gathering of fictitious people, uh, not real, real people, but in a fictitious event. Also, are uh, there all portraits of painters of the time in Antwerp that are uh, looking at small sculptures as well as at prints that you see there. What is extraordinary is all these paintings are real, are paintings that existed. Uh, at the very, here, for example, is a lost painting by Van Eyck that we know of, which is the toilet, the, what's it again, the, the, the lady at her toilet mm -hmm. is here. And that's a painting he did that we know of. There is still a copy of it by another painter, but uh, it has been destroyed. Uh, you have painting a, a portrait by uh, Dürer self-portrait by Dürer there. And you have paintings by all kinds of uh, Antwerpenars, the people from Antwerp uh, that are shown there, as well as a plaster cast of uh, classical sculpture. And then you have here the coat of arms of Van der Geest, who was an extremely rich merchant in um, Cross. But this shows you that, that uh, desire for collecting that is really starting at the time and uh, comes not only from Italy, but also uh, was rampant in rich families in the north. This is another uh, proof of that, and we'll go more in detail on that painting, but uh, Rubens is going to collaborate with some painting, particularly with Jan Bruegel uh, that you see here. Uh, that's a painting of uh, the allegory of sight, the, the, the allegory of the, the different, uh, how do you call them, the, the sight and, and the hearing and so on. Uh, we'll detail that one a little more. So Rubens did the figures and Bruegel made the whole decor. Also, he did some uh, paintings uh, for his friend, uh, the older man, Nicolas Hocox, who became also the mayor of Antwerp. And this uh, one of these early paintings, uh, biblical subject showing Samson and Delilah. And this was supposed to hang into the, the largest room of uh, the Hocox house. And you can see that the study of Michelangelo, there is no doubt that Michelangelo is present when you see the musculature of Samson but you also have the light of Tintoretto in there. And then he gets married and he made that uh, wonderful portrait of him and Isabella uh, that is not showing him as a painter, but really showing him as a gentleman. He's a, a man well off. Uh, as I mentioned, he's a handsome man and she's a pretty woman and shows them really as bourgeois, the well-established uh, bourgeois, elegant costumes, but he cannot step completely away from the Flemish tradition. And when you see the bow of honeysuckle, uh, there, that uh, is part of the medieval gardens, it's a bonds of love uh, for the honeysuckle. They show the class, the clasped hands, which is marital, fi marital fidelity, but also shows a real affection between them. So you don't have just a formal painting, but this is really the beginning of a much more natural encounter between the two spouses. And that uh, Rembrandt is going to pretty much mimic when he makes his own portrait uh, after getting married. You don't have just an economic contract, but you have real love between these two. And you can see that he doesn't wear the ruff, by the way. He has a lace collar. He's then going to be asked to paint uh, 
and that really quickly after he comes back in 1609, because many important people are going to come to Antwerp to sign the famous, famous treaties that is starting the uh, peace, that truce that's going to last for 12 years. Uh, he's asked to paint a painting of the, the Magi to hang in the town hall. And they represent that submission of human beings to the church, in fact. This is what you see. You see the red line that I put there is that this was the original size of it. Uh, some years later, while that painting is in Spain, he's going to enlarge it uh, and actually introduce himself here as, as one of the writers. Uh, this is an amazing painting when you see the Virgin Mary is unusually standing. And uh, uh, you have the, the three Magi, one is uh, kneeling in front of Jesus, and you have that beautiful light emanating from uh, baby Jesus. And then you have uh, Balthazar and Gaspar, and, uh, and I never know if it's Gaspar, or, no, the, the, one, the one that is standing is Melchior and then Gaspar here. And you have that whole movement of the crowd is coming to admire that young baby that is so promising. So that painting is going to hang in the town hall, but will be given to a Spanish ambassador when he gives them special uh, privileges for the sale of spices. The, the city is going to offer that painting to the, the ambassador, and he, uh, Philip IV will buy it from him. Uh, and so that's why it uh, is in the Prado in Madrid. And the next visit of, um, of uh, Rubens in Spain, he's going to enlarge the canvas, probably at the demand, at the request of the king. Then comes two huge commission, and I really have to hurry, I'm talking too much. <laughs> but uh, he's asked to make uh, the altarpiece for the, the church of Sinualburga. Uh, as you can see in that thing, the altar was elevated compared to the place, it, that's for our architectural reason, was elevated. And so that altarpiece is much higher than it would be in a regular church where it would be at the same level or more or less the same level as the, the, uh, the, the, um, the, the regular people. And so uh, the painting was huge and you will see it compared to other places. Uh, had a predella that they had to remove because it didn't fit uh, on the altar, but had on top of that the painting of, of God the Father and then some angels that were on either side of it. The, unfortunately, the painting, painting uh, was uh, taken to France at the time of the revolution. At the same time, the church is going to be demolished by the French uh, revolutionaries. Uh, that was one of the most, the prettiest churches in Antwerp at the time. And it was when it was restituted in 1815, um, reluctantly. It was then uh, brought back because the church didn't exist. It was included then in the paintings in the cathedral, the, the extraordinary cathedral in Antwerp. And I brought this painting, this uh, image, because it gives you an idea of the proportion. It's a huge, huge altarpiece, much larger than the altarpieces that were done at that time. So what we have is a con what we call a continuous narrative. If you look at the back, the background of the painting, it's it's a continuous landscape. So what you see in front of you is in fact one event, and uh, of course you have in the center that extraordinary image of Christ uh, on the cross that is raised with great efforts by all these colossus there that are straightening. The, the cross, which is, of course, not the way it would have been uh, normally. Uh, normally, the, the post, the central post, would always be in the ground and reused for each crucifixion. 
only the transversal uh, beam would be taken and port and uh, carried by the the man who was going to be crucified. So that very strong diagonal that is repeated here by women and the reverse diagonal on the other side is so typical of the Baroque period. It gives you all that dynamics that you have instead of the straight, you know, uh, Renaissance, more calmer Renaissance type of, of um, pattern. What uh, you can notice immediately when you see the Christ is that Christ is very alive. He's been through terrible moments, but he's shown as a victorious Christ. And that's the whole idea, is that Rubens is looking at Christ that is going to overcome all that pain and save us at the same time. And this is really the idea of what you see there, is always for a strong face. As you can see, Mary, respects the way he represents Mary, respects the Bible, the, the New Testament, where she's standing. She's not uh, on, at the feet of the cross. She's standing and holding the hands of John. When you close, and that would be the normal position of the triptych, they typically the triptychs were closed during the week uh, often open during on the Sunday or special feast days. And so when you close it, this is what you have on the reverse is a view of two, uh, four saints that were dear to St. Walburga's church, uh, St. Amand and Walburgus and St. Eligius and uh, Catherine. Catherine not shown for once with her broken wheel, but with the sword. Rubens has looked at other painters. He has looked at Tintoretto, not at the main figure, but he's looking at this figure. And this is where he finds his inspiration for it. And you can see it here. And some quite enhanced figures at the, at the, foot, of the, at the foot of the cross. The way uh, Rubens was working is he would first submit what you call a modello. So he would make a small uh, oil painting and then show it to the patron. And they would decide if they wanted to change anything. And so this is the way he would uh, show it. And this is rather small. It's 26 by uh, 26 inch by nine, nine 13. So it's a small model, but the people would have an idea of what he was going to do. Then he would make some choke drawings. You can see here, he changed the face, but that's the body. And you have the figure at the bottom. And so he would have, that's just for the hands, the hands of the Virgin. So he would have these chalk drawings that he would keep and that he would put in the hand of his assistants. We have to realize he didn't paint himself all these things. He had an enormous, he had up to 20 assistants in his studio. Uh, in 10 years time, he did 70 altarpieces. It's incredible when you think about it. So he couldn't do it all by himself. He would do the design. He would have these very detailed drawings. He would give it to the, the assistants or collaborators that were at the right level. And then at the end, he would come and touch up. And guess what? He rarely signed. But this is the way he was. it was working. And then what is interesting, he would often, and it beca became uh, more and more natural for him to have uh, engravings made of his works that would certify that it was his. That's a kind of a copyright, if you want. He was asked uh, about the same time to make this resurrection that is also in uh, the, in the Antwerp Cathedral. It's a resurrection. I'm not going to spend too much time, but this is uh, one word. And then the reverse of the wings, just beautiful, two angels. 
And that's where he applies the idea that it should show flesh even if it's stone. The, the whole idea for him. A little later, he's asked them to make a painting for the cathedral there, which is a large altarpiece. He's asked by the Musketeer Guild to make this one, which is the descent from the cross. And they now displayed on either side of in the transept, you have on one side the, the raising of the cross and the other one the descent of the cross that are pendants, if you want, but this was not originally the case. And it shows again very a very different Christ, very limp. Uh, this is not a continuous narrative. There's to the contrary, the contrast of and it's a uh, um, deliberate move from Rubens that it shows three times where Christ is carried because it's uh, the patron that we'll see when we close the, the wings is Christophorus, Christopher. And Christophorus is the one that carries Christ. That's the, the, the term, the etymology of the term. And so here you see Mary in the visitation who is carrying Christ in the womb. You have there Christ carried at the presentation at the temple and here, the body of Christ carried by Nicodemus and uh, John actually there and Mary standing next to it. Also an incredible, the colors are amazing. So here you have an idea, it's Laucon comes in and is part of the inspiration for the movement. He's actually in, um, influenced by a painting by Daniele da Volterra, uh, who uh, made this painting according to a drawing that had been given to him by Michelangelo. And so he's following some of the, the similar patterns. And Val Volterra might be more known for you to having paint painted over the last judgment of Michelangelo painted to, to hide the genitalia asked by the advisor to the Pope. When you close the wings, this is uh, what you see, the uh, Christopher on the left and the hermit that is uh, providing the light next to him. And as you can see, the uh, Farnese Hercules is the inspiration for Christophorus. And uh, on the other side, you have studies for the baby, for the baby Jesus. So you don't think that he studied anatomy, he just took from the statues of antiquity, etc. He probably st studied anatomy. It wasn't easy to study anatomy because you didn't have access to dead bodies easily. So uh, mostly he's going to, he probably looked at treatises, but it's mostly statues, a classical statue, at least at the beginning. This is mostly what he's going to do. He also received, uh, but that's in uh, 26, he received the commission for the, altar, the main altarpiece at the uh, cathedral, Antwerp Cathedral. And this is the assumption of the Virgin. Of course, assumption that is not, that doesn't derive from the Bible, but it's an ecclesiastical tradition that took place in the Middle Age. <laughs> It by that time had become a very popular theme. What is interesting is you see the, the women at the, the, the foot of the Virgin that have had uh, taken care of her. So in the center, it's actually a portrait of his wife and she died just a few months after he painted this. So here's quickly a view of Ruben Scheuss in Antwerp. It has been re-restored. Uh, so this is the original uh, uh, house made of bricks and stone that he had bought. And then he added this house that doesn't look extraordinary from the outside, but once you get into the courtyard is just incredible. 
He also built a very large studio at two different levels where uh, he had the ground uh, level and his uh, assistant and students would be on the uh, second floor. Uh, you can see that screen that would uh, allow the access to the courtyard where he had fountains and nymphia and everything. Just uh, very, very Italian type of architecture inside. Busts and galleries and everything, all designed by him. Inside, uh, one of the most uh, incredible room is the one that you see on the left where he would have his collection of art. Uh, including cameos and medals, busts, uh, paintings, and so on, that was a pattern after the Pantheon in Rome. And the rest of the house is very, has been very richly furnished with uh, the, the big uh, wooden furniture that was very typically Flemish at the time. The, the house became a real model, so it appears in some paintings, as you can see. In this painting here, this is actually a rendition of uh, Rubens Rotonda. But this is also by uh, Willem van Acht. Uh, Rubens during his lifetime was considered as the Apelles of Antwerp. Apelles being the painter to, um, oh, come on, the um, Alexander the Great. And Apelles was, adored by Alexander the Great. And uh, so having the idea of uh, comparing uh, Rubens with Apelles was something very important that this idea of classical time, you had only two or three known painters, Xerxes, but Apelles was above all. And so for uh, people would call him the Apelles of Antwerp, which is an extraordinary painter. A quick word on his workshop, and I'm gonna run longer than I said, I'm sorry. Uh, he had more than 20 pupils and or assistant that had been identified. We don't have, because he didn't have to register them, we don't even have a regular list that we know of. Uh, he didn't have to register them with the guild because he was a court painter. The way he would work out his contracts was, uh, the price was uh, proportional to his participation. So he was painting something all by himself. It would be outrageously expensive. Uh, if, he was, if he painted in part, for example, the face, and then his assistant would do the rest, it was cheaper. Otherwise he would have supervised copies where he would come at the end, you know, just provide always the design, but then he would come and then touch up at the last thing, a little more here, a little more red on the cheek or whatever, uh, that was the cheaper one. And often subcontracted elements such as animal, landscape, or still lives in a large composition to specialists. As I mentioned, he would make modellos. So you have here that kind of a formal presentation. This is one for the lion hunt. Uh, on a small scale, he makes that uh, uh, oil model. Uh, or even simpler is the bozzetto, where he really projects uh, very rapidly his idea. And he was so, he was known to be so uh, exuberant that often he had to stick a piece of paper uh, next to it because he would go off a board. He, would, he just, he had a very spontaneous brush. <laughs> one of my favorite uh, studies is probably this one of the, the foreheads of a black man. It's just extraordinary how he captures the color of the skin and the, the different pigments that you can recognize in the face. Uh, and then at the back, you have what you call the imprimatura, which is that background color that's going to become the medium ground on the painting, and he can use them for highlights and so on, letting come through. In this case, he's going to use the one on the top in this other adoration of the matcha in 19, and you can see he is, in fact, the, that part of the, the study. Mm -hmm. 
he was known and that really appreciate for the expression of his figures. And this is a fierce look of the, the mage. It's, it's just superb. There is there's a series of the four evangelists um, in Madrid that are just extraordinary by their, their face. It's just superb. And we'll see, we have a special one on, on portraiture. So I'm not showing too many portraits. Here, I'm gonna go a little faster. These are four evangelists. You can recognize them because they have their partners in crime. So you have seen Luke and the, the bull. You have seen Matthew and the angel. You have uh, seen Mark and the lion and St. John and the Eagle. These are a few others of his uh, paintings. This is the Lamentation of Christ. That is also, you can see some Italian influence very much. He's looked, as we say, to Titian. So once we go to mythological images, it's really interesting how he interprets differently some of this. This is one of the many uh, Venus in front of the mirror that we can find along art history, but compare with the one by Titian. And it's, it's very different. It's just... Um, more lively, I would say, and then you see the face of the Venus speaking in the in the mirror. The four river of paradise. Uh, these often the continents and the rivers were uh, shown as allegories by by men, and so uh, you can uh, look at uh, the Danube. Here with a white woman, then you're representing uh, Europe. Then you have Africa with the Nile River, with the, the allegory holding the, the arm of a black woman. The uh, Ganges is here with the tiger. Oh, sorry. No, 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 no. That's not what I want. There we are. And then uh, the Rio de la Plata at the back that represents uh, yeah. South America. It's the same allegory of Bernini. Yes, it, they, but th that was a typical iconography for, for, um, for the rivers. And it also shows the four continents. So these are commissioned. It's, you know, you would have the Duke uh, or whatever is going to say, I want a large painting representing the four continents because he wants to travel or whatever. These are typically commissioned. He wouldn't paint that and keep it in his studio. These are typically commissioned. Here is the rape of the daughter of uh, Lucipus, where you see uh, in influence by the night by Michelangelo, uh, where he shows and he's be, he was there, and you see here the drawing that he did of the same uh, sculpture that is an inspiration for one of the figures, uh, the, the, one of the daughters that are at that time. The rape was an idea, exciting idea at that period. They would say they are kidnapping them and the rape is it follows. And it was for people, it has been very much criticized nowadays, but it was that idea of uh, a certain violence, but that would end up in sexual encounter. They were, the two girls were promised to these two guys, but they couldn't wait until they, they would go normally. And so they, they are kidnapping them. And these are Castor and Pollux. Also, he was absolutely entranced with the study uh, that he had encountered by Leonardo. And this is an engraving by Lorenzo Sacchia who had copied it after Leonardo. And this is by Rubens. This is Rubens interpretation of the famous battle of Anghiari that was supposed to hang in the Palazzo Vecchio in Florence and was never finished. Um, there was that big contest between Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci. So he translated that in that painting, the battle for the flag. And this became kind of the source for many of his very large painting of hunting. 
And so he received uh, the commission for the um, uh, Maximilian I, elector of Bavaria, to decorate the Schleisheim uh, Palace uh, in Bavaria. And so he, he had the commission for four huge uh, hunting uh, paintings. Uh, this one is the hippopotamus and crocodile hunt. Uh, he had apparently seen, uh, because it's so well rendered, in Rome, they had apparently for a while a, hippo a dead hippopotamus put in the special fluid so that it wouldn't rot. And people, painters came to see so that they could sketch him. And this is believed to be the result of these sketches where it's very, very real. Another of these, and by the way, uh, that one is the only one of the four that was recovered from the, the Napoleonic uh, looting. The four paintings were taken to, to Paris, seen because we can see the influence on the Lacroix until they were sent back. Uh, on this, that one, uh, the first one was sent back. The others, as you can see, this one is in Rennes and they are all in a smaller museum around France and never return. This one actually, the original burned in Bordeaux uh, and only, only a copy exists. And this is a copy. And this one of the wild boar, and this is, is Marseille. So you can see there still are a lot of the looted paintings that exist that are still in France. He also did some wonderful smaller subjects and this is, a wonderful painting that he kept with him for the rest of his life that probably was used as a model for his assistant that he chose the old woman the boy with candles and it became an example for many of the dutch painters later on some group portraits we'll see again portraits later on this is his friend jan bruegel and his family this one you're probably more familiar with, the famous uh, portrait of Susanna Formant, which was being misnamed the Chapeau de Pie. It's not pie, it's felt. But felt in French is poil, and so they mistranslated. So instead of Chapeau de Pie, it would be Chapeau de Poil for felt. And so it's, it's not, either, but it did influence or Elisabeth Vigée Lebrun, uh, the famous straw hat was totally inspired by Vigée Lebrun visiting the uh, museum in the National Gallery and sewing that painting by Rubens. As I mentioned, he had for his first marriage, three children. Nicolas, that is the younger of the boy. They are two different, they're just adorable. And these, you can see his genius because it's personal. It's, it's very intimate type of uh, rendering. Nicolas became uh, quite a scholar, a scholar on antiquity. But his favorite was Clara, the old, the, his first child. And that, wonderful portrait of Clara Serena. Uh, she's four there. Look at the look at the touch, the brush is just superb. And then a little older. And the one on the left is interesting. It belonged to the Metropolitan. No, it's not the one. Yeah. It belonged to the Metropolitan. I made a mistake, sorry, in the, the label. And uh, the, it was looked at as a copy or studio piece. It was covered at that time with greenish paint and the Metropolitan deaccessioned it. And it was bought 10 times the price that was supposed to be sold at the auction and the collector bought it, had it cleaned and it revealed that it was a Rubens. And uh, it's now going around. Any exposition on Rubens is there. 
look again the, the touch that highlight on you see with with really the impasto and the, the delicate way he paints the hair is just amazing the other one that is at the albertina is her probably just before she died and you can see the young woman you know 12 years old the girl is getting there and this is a very touching image. It's probably, it's four years after she died, his belief of what she would have turned to. A, a beautiful woman. His first wife, he adored his first wife. She was very full of wit, had a lot of uh, character and was very smart. And these are two of uh, painting and drawing that he did of her. And you can see in the girl, by the way, a lot of the mother. So I've really lasted 15 minutes more than I said I would, but it was a lot of material. Uh, for next time, we'll see Ruben's later years and a, a lot of the big commissions he's going to receive. Let me just finish the recording.